Word. Perfect. Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, I'm so glad that you all can join us on a Monday afternoon. I know that's not always easy, um, but my name is Prashasti and I'm really thrilled today to welcome our fantastic group of panelists um, who are all spotlighted um, and who will lead us into a discussion on immigrant immigration and AAPI, uh, which is Asian, Asian Americans and Pacific Islander justice as part of the Immigration and Scholars series. Um, and Immigration AND is a new justice-oriented program that is open to everyone. And I dropped a link in the chat if you kind of want to peruse uh, some of our materials. Um, but today, today's space is a space of a lot of reflection and hopefully some imagination. So we will start today with welcoming our panelists and then be in conversation with them for about 50 minutes. Uh, we will end with some resources that I'll also send in a follow-up email. But if during our conversation you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll monitor them and notify the moderator accordingly. Um, with that, I will hand it over to our incredible moderator, Diane. Um, who is also the senior proofing editor for the Georgetown Immigration Law Journal. So, Diane, here you go. Thanks, Rashasti. Um, I think we'll go uh, ahead and get started right away. Um, and I want to invite the panelists to introduce themselves briefly, keeping it to one minute. Um, Prashasti is also going to drop links to the panelists' bios in the chat. Um, could we start with you, Erica? Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this um, amazing event, but also the, the whole initiative. I think it's really important. Uh, my name is Erica Lee, and I'm joining you from Minneapolis, which is located on Dakota land. And I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind as we think about immigration and justice is to consider the ways in which the migration and settlement of immigrants and refugees have been part of the same US settler colonial practices that continue to displace and dispossess indigenous peoples. And uh, without considering those roots, as well as the consequences and legacies, we're only really talking about partial justice. Uh, I teach history and Asian American studies at the University of Minnesota. I also direct the Immigration History Research Center and uh, I'm president-elect of the Organization of American Historians. Thank you. Um, could we go to you next, Gisela? Yes, and it's great to be here. I am very excited to um, nourish and encourage many of your future public interest careers. Um, my name is Gisela Perez kusakawa I'm the assistant director on the Interracial Profiling Project at Asian Americans Advancing Justice AJC. My work deals with the intersections of national security, technology, and immigration. So that includes the rise of incarceration under the Biden administration, and also the profiling of different um, Chinese researchers and scientists and the broader MEMSA community. I'm very excited to have this discussion with you all. Um, we always need future advocates. Um, who, who will trek in the field with us. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll go to Nazneen next. Good afternoon. Um, it's really, I'm really happy to be here with all of you and excited to not only learn from um, the other panelists, but also from all of you about what you're dealing with in the immigration world. Um, I am the executive director of a, the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center. We're based in DC and we provide um, direct civil legal services to the Asian Pacific Islander um, immigrant community in metropolitan DC. Um, I have been a legal services attorney since I graduated from law school in 1992 and um, always providing direct services. Um, and I've been executive director here for about six years now. Um, and, you know, two of the issues that we constantly see here are immigration and family law. Um, and we'll talk about more about you know how that how immigrants are impacted by those um, two um, areas of law. So thank you for letting me um, be on this panel. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Ellen. Hi everybody. I just want to say thank you for uh, Georgetown Law Immigration Law Journal for inviting me, and for Shadi and Diane in particular for running today's event. Um, I am also um, I am 
calling in from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. And I do want to recognize that we are built on um, the homelands of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee peoples. And I acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Um, I am a historian. I work um, on US history, um, what we call modern or 20th century US history, dabbling into the 21st century. Um, and I'm most interested in race and immigration history. And I have a deep love of um, Asian American history. And I'll just mention that I am um, currently working on a new book on the history of Asian Americans and racial justice, which will include immigration issues. Uh, and I've also published uh, a book uh, previously, The Color of Success, which is uh, a history of the model minority stereotype. Uh, and this year I am um, actually very excited to be a fellow with New America. And so they are helping to uh, uh, underwrite or sponsor my research and writing. So that's me. Okay, great, thank you all. Um, so I think we're gonna dive into the questions now. Um, so we have some questions that are directed to some people, um, but feel free to jump in at any point if you have anything that you want to add. Um, we do have subparts to each question, so feel free to pick and choose any part that speaks the most to you. You don't have to address um, every single part of the question. Um, so we're going to start with this topic of the model minority myth and racialization. Um, we want to talk about, we, we just want to reflect a little bit on the history of AAPI immigration and the particular way in which AAPI communities are racialized. What is the space or place of Asian and Pacific Islander immigrants in the racial order of the United States? And how does the immigration system maintain that? What is the purpose of this racialization? Um, I'd love to start with Erica. Sure. I, I think maybe Ellen and I can tag team and and answer various different parts of this, um, but it's a it's a big question, <laughs> and um, and we're talking about historical roots and building a system of racial exclusion built into a racial hierarchy from the late nineteenth century to the early twentieth century, with consequences and legacies today. Um, so one of the things that I think is is really important to consider again. We're historians, so we're going to go way back, but there's really no way to understand the racial order and where Asian Americans fit into it without the prehistory, you know, so before Asians um, migrated to the United States, again, a nation built on slavery and settler colonialism. And when we think about then this world in which Asian migrants first entered into, the question that lawmakers and Americans asked was, are they white or are they not? Uh, and for the 19th century into the 20th century, the question was, as Ellen's work has shown so well, definitively not white. So they were treated uh, much more along the lines of um, African-Americans who were uh, segregated, um, victims of racial terror, um, disfranchised, as well as American Indians. Again, also segregated, considered um, non-citizens, et cetera. So this is different when we're talking about immigration. You know, This is different than European immigrants who for sure faced restriction, prejudice, bias, xenophobia as well, um, but were considered for the most part assimilable. Maybe some of them would take a little bit more work, a little bit more coercive Americanization campaigns, but assimilable. Asians were not uh, inassimilable aliens. They were forever foreigners, uh, unfit to become American citizens. So this is why as we're studying the history of immigration, we see the very first well, first, state attempts to limit the um, entry and movement of, of Asian migrants into state borders and then federal laws. Uh, of course, the 1862 Cooley Act, the 1875 Page uh, Law, which targeted Asian uh, women, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, by the 1930s, all Asians were um, 
largely barred from entering the United States, prohibited from becoming naturalized citizens. And this would apply also to Filipinos who had been um, US nationals when the Philippines was a formal colony. Uh, and that's, that gets us to World War II and some major changes that, that I think Ellen can then um, nicely uh, discuss the origins of the model minority and some of the some of the consequences that we see into the pandemic. Okay, sure. Thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, so something that I found during my research is um, to really understand the, the position, as you're asking, of the uh, Asian Americans and the racial order. Um, I do think a lot of roads for us today lead back to World War II. Um, and so it's really about thinking about this intersection between the United States uh, geopolitical interests in waging wars and becoming a global power, intersecting with the demands and the really the escalation uh, of the Black freedom movement and um, the calls for jobs, for justice uh, that Black folks wanted. Uh, and also, uh, I really want to stress the agency of Asian Americans themselves. I think that's something that often gets lost when we talk about how Asian Americans might be stereotyped or racialized. Uh, we, uh, I think it's very common to, uh, for people to say, you know, that essentially white people dumped this, um, you know, stereotype on Asian Americans, but really Asian Americans had a hand in recasting themselves. So Erica was talking about how, you know, before World War II, Asians were reviled, um, treated um, really terribly uh, as uh, decidedly or definitively not white. And so, you know, we might say, of course, Asian uh, people of Asian ancestry had a real interest in uh, trying to basically, you know, change the conversation, right? Reshape that narrative and redirect it. And so through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there's there's a series of, we might say, opportunities that arise because of these, you know, the US wanting to be able to power, the Black Freedom Movement, uh, and then Asian Americans' own yearning for better treatment. So that does include the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, uh, which um, in, a, in a sort of ironic way, really was an assimilation project because the federal government, uh, the authorities were actually liberals of the time, and they treated it as a kind of a laboratory to encourage Japanese Americans to assimilate into American society, which is a really big um, very big contrast to thinking about exclusionists who just want to essentially expel and get rid of all Asians. Um, then there's uh, the Cold War and the United States wanting to win hearts and minds around the world. Um, and this, uh, you know, this, the rise of anti-communism then actually provides a, a new kind of um, a, a cultural space, a way for um, Asian Americans, and especially I would say Chinese, to make claims that uh, because they're anti-communist, they're good uh, patriots, and they're they're therefore worthy of being considered good Americans, even if they're still thought of as Chinese and foreign. But it's in this assimilable assimilable anti-communist way that could benefit the United States global image. Um, and then by the time we get to the 60s, there is uh, you know the escalation of the Black Freedom Movement. Certainly um, by the mid to late 60s, uh, the United States is really engulfed in a series of urban rebellions. And it's really at that time that liberals, uh, and then liberals in a lot of ways start to uh, wring their hands and, and you know, they're like, oh, liberalism isn't working to solve the problem, you know, of, of black people's situation in American life. Uh, and, and some of them start to turn to Chinese and Japanese as these um, sort of like examples of people of color that seem to be doing quite well in American society. So there's politicians, journalists, social scientists, uh, and the like. And I should just mention one more thing, which is um, all of this rebranding of Asian Americans as model minority um, rides a lot on the dispossession and colonization of indigenous indigenous peoples of the Pacific. I say Hawaii in particular stands out uh, because this is a moment when um, Hawaii that, you know, Hawaii was an independent kingdom colonized by the United States in the late 19th century, uh, given territorial status. Um, and then in the 40s and 50s, uh, basically white people sort of uh, decided that uh, this territory that's full of Asian people and native peoples, um, actually we can't admit them to statehood because this will help us 
win the Cold War by showing Asia that we're not um, racist. So that's actually a very liberal move towards inclusion that um, glosses over this history of colonization uh, of, uh, of people uh, in uh, not only Hawaii, but in places like Samoa uh, and Guam. So uh, that's a very long, long way of answering your question, I think, um, to understand. And I think the argument here is, again, that um, we have to understand the intersection between global forces, um, I would say definitely the Black Freedom Movement, and the interests of Asian Americans themselves in um, um, becoming this you know, model minority group. Yeah. And so I Oh, go ahead. I'll just pause there uh, so you can jump in. Thank you. Erica and Ellen provided such robust foundation. I learned a few new things about our history. Um, I wanted to, from an Asian American civil rights space, kind of discuss what we consider are some of the dangers of the model minority myth. Um, I think first is the, the danger in this myth is that it creates this idea that there is a good minority and that other marginalized communities are not doing well because somehow of their own fault or, or their own accord. And so we continuously see in the advocacy space this use of Asian Americans as a sort of wedge um, between communities of, of color. Um, the other thing is that it glosses over the fact um, that we have a wide diversity of experience within the API community. We actually have the largest wealth gap here in, in the country. So there are certainly some who are doing well, but we have a large segment who are not. And I know for many students, this can be a challenge, um, not recognizing you know, the folks who do need financial assistance, who do come from low-income neighborhoods and who do have families that are funneled into a school to deportation pipeline. And so part of the dangers that you know, we're seeing is that it really renders those who do need, have needs within the community, it renders them invisible. Um, so I just wanted to lift that up from, from the civil rights space. Great, thank you all. Um, Nazim, do you have anything that you want to add? I was just going to add, like I, I do agree with you know what Gisela was saying as well, and I think that from the work that I have done um, as a legal services attorney, you know, you do see that wealth gap, and um, you know there are issues with a lot of Asian Americans who won't go to a legal services program for assistance because of cultural barriers and cultural issues not just the language barriers that we see, but it does come down to when you go in, you know, they, you sometimes are looked at like, well, why are you here? Why aren't you doing well? And I think that, you know, part of it is also when we look at immigration laws and how they transpired, and I can talk from my own family, you know, my father came here as a graduate student. And so I think that, you know, in the late 50s, in the 50s and 60s, a lot of South Asians that came to the US were ones that were going to school here. And so that actually, it sort of buys into the model minority myth because these are people who are educated, who have that, but immigration isn't that way. And you know, when we, we now know that you know, there are a lot of Asians that came to this country um, for a variety of reasons, you know, from, the, from the early Chinese settlers who came here to help with the railroads and going forward, um, but we don't see that because what we are looking at and what, you know, the, I think that the media and the government portrays are those who came here as students, who are doctors, who are engineers, who are professionals, but there is a large community that is not, and they stay hidden because they don't want to come out and be looked at as, you know, um, as not only different, but that they don't fit that, that, that model, that model minority. Great, thank you. Um, so you touched on this a little bit already, um, but there does seem to be this particular erasure of Asian and Pacific Islander immigrants from direct legal services, um, and particularly of Pacific Islander voices and experiences. Um, so what are some common areas of needs among AAPI immigrant communities and why? Could we go back to you, Nazine? Sure, I'm not sure if Ellen or Erica want to uh, do any say anything else about the first topic, but um, so I'll let them if they have anything else to add because no, okay. <laughs> um, so as I said, I've been a legal services attorney for um, an, a long time now, um, almost 30 years. 
And I will say that one of the issues that I've seen in legal services is that, first of all, when you walk in, who the you know, especially when I started 30 years ago, what you saw were mostly um, white men and white women who were the ones that were doing legal services. I think that for almost all the programs that I worked for, and I've worked for several, I was the first Asian American that was at those programs. I was the first one that spoke a non, you know, didn't speak Spanish, didn't well, and didn't speak, um, and didn't speak, you know, an, 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 another language that was, you know, looked upon as, oh, this is what we need. I spoke Urdu, and, um, you know, that was a language that it was not, it was the first Asian language they had in, in the programs. Um, I will tell you that not much has changed over the years, although there is more of a recognition that there is a population that is not being served. Um, you know, my first job at Alaska was in Spokane, Washington, and there was a large Hmong population there. But no one in our program spoke, spoke the language that, you know, that, that would, was needed. Um, and, you know, that continued through, you know, I worked in two different programs in New Jersey, a program in Virginia, I've been around a lot, um, but none of them, or if they did, it was for a very short period of time, had someone who spoke an Asian language. Even though in each of those communities, there was a large population of low income Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, you know, when I worked in New Jersey, I worked in Northern New Jersey and there was a large Korean population. But, you know, it was, they did not, we did not see them come into our office. Um, when I was in Virginia, you know, there was a Vietnamese population, there was a Korean population. There were all these different Asian populations, but the number of, of applicants that we got for services was very low. And I think two of the issues was one is just language barriers. You know, it's very difficult to call and to be able to speak with someone in your, in your native language right off the, right up, right up, right away. Um, and so it takes time. And, you know, within that time period there, they, I think that some people just like, I can't, you know, I, I want someone who speaks that understands who I am and who speaks the language I speak. The second issue is the cultural barriers. Um, you know, sometimes we look at it and a lot of Asian cultures are very much community based. And so you, you're not, you're not going to go outside the community for services, even though, you know, they, the community may not have the, the legal expertise that you need. Um, I've worked in housing, I've worked in public benefits, I've worked in you know, social security, a lot of different legal, um, legal you know, I've done a lot of different types of legal work um, and partly because again, as a legal services attorney, you sort of, you know, you can, there's a lot of different issues that you can do, work with. But, the, but again, the main issue is that, they, that I, I've not seen a lot of Asian Americans until I came to this program where I am now. Um, and I think that, you know, the two areas that we see the most is immigration and family law, because that is a lot of where, where culture and language play a huge, have a huge impact. Um, you know, for what we've seen is, um, and domestic violence, I will say that's the other area that we see a large impact with, um, with the Asian Pacific Islander community. Um, I think that, you know, one of the, reasons that programs like mine or programs that have a specific unit that works with the Asian Pacific Islander community are more successful in having this in having them people come in for services is because we recognize that there are language barriers and that there are cultural barriers and and the uh, the last barrier is that some a lot of times we have clients that come from countries where there is a huge distrust of the government and so when you factor all of those things in, it's, it's harder to have people understand and recognize you as somebody that's able to assist them. Great, um, thank you, Ms. Neen. Um, so building off of um, your really helpful insight and experiences that you shared with us, um, I'm wondering if anyone else in the panel, um, maybe Gazella, um, if you have thoughts on how, how do we center the experiences and needs of Pacific Islander immigrants within the AAPI legal advocacy and justice work? 
Thank you, Dan. Well, I want to share, so for our organization, um, we don't often do uh, legal services, but we do do legal referral work and we also do impact litigation. Um, and so for those who are interested in, in sort of entering that space, that's where really you as an organization focus your resources on cases that have the biggest uh, impact nationwide. Um, so oftentimes a good example is when we had um, successfully removed the citizenship question to 2020 census. And so we know there are a lot of um, issues that have broad impacts um, to our communities as a whole. And so it's very important that we recognize that, but also disaggregate a lot of these impacts so we can see how is it impacting the minorities within the minorities, right? How is it impacting Pacific Islanders? How is it uh, impacting Southeast Asians when it comes to detention and deportation work? Um, so even as we work on AAPI issues as a whole, we always wanna make sure that we look into the specific issues that impact um, and communities rather than always looking at us, uh, you know, as just one big uh, clump of a population. And so that's always important and, and sort of part of the work that we have to keep doing. Great, thank you all. Um, we're gonna move on to um, another topic now. Um, and it's rise in anti-Asian violence. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to have today's discussion without acknowledging the exponential rise in anti-Asian racism and violence in this country. Um, what histories are important for us to remember to understand the particular violence against Asian women? Um, how do we fight for justice while resisting the construction of hate crimes that continues to operate within the carceral apparatus? Um, could we start with you, Erica? Sure. Um, I actually want to add another origin story, and that is the history of Asian American communities organizing against hate as well. Um, so I mentioned in my very, very brief, breathless history of anti-Asian laws, the 1875 Page Act, um, one of the first federal laws to target Asian immigrants, in particular Asian immigrant women. Um, so the longstanding fetishization of Asian women, um, it goes hand in hand with histories of US empire, colonialism, um, international relations with Asia. It has impacted, shaped the, both the, the intersections, the racialization and um, sexualization of Asian women, whether it's the Chinese prostitute, the dragon lady, the lotus blossom, the geisha, um, the, um, the belly dancer, I mean, it, it's all wrapped up in a longstanding Orientalist um, uh, popular culture and sort of, you know, way of, of thinking about and understanding Asian women. But it's not just, it's not just the, um, the stereotypes. Some of the most exciting new scholarship in Asian American history examines the ways in which our um, US military occupations and interventions in Asia have helped to establish a, a, a industry of militarized prostitution, um, whether it's in Korea or Vietnam, um, the Philippines. And so this is, it's not, these are not 19th century stereotypes. They are ongoing structures that help to, um, to move this, these ideas um, forward into our present, but also structure the, the relationships um, between um, Asian uh, women and, um, and non-Asian American men, um, but also just sort of seeping into our consciousness um, overall. So this is, I, I think it's really important to think about this as something that's continuing to happen today. Um, and we see this, we saw this with some of the media after the tragic um, murders, the shootings in Atlanta, which is going to be, it's going to be a year. It's going to be a year next week on, on March 16th. Um, but the shooters claims that the spas where the Asian women worked was, it were a quote unquote temptation that he had to eliminate. Um, 
So I think we need to understand this ongoing um, racialization. We also see this in the numbers. Stop AAPI hate shows that 68% of the hate incidents that have been reported um, have been reported by women. Uh, so we, we, we really just need to pause and understand the ways in which um, anti-Asian racism and sexism are continuing to impact um, our communities. The other side of it is that we wouldn't know these numbers without organizations like Stop AAPI Hate. And for many, for many, it seemed like Stop AAPI Hate and, and other tracking um, um, tools and mechanisms just sort of came out of nowhere in March of 2020. But if you look at the folks behind Stop AAPI Hate, you will better understand that their roots are in um, Asian American serving organizations that began in the 1960s. These are organizations that have been serving communities for generations, meaning that when people are under duress or in crisis, they know who to go to. It's not some newcomer, it's not someone who's um, an outsider, but they are going to the same um, organizations that are embedded in their neighborhoods. And that is the kind of um, activism and response that I think has been particularly helpful. Um, I look forward to having more conversations about the carceral um, response. Uh, I know that you know one of the one of the big quote unquote wins was the um, anti um, the COVID hate crimes act. You know, and, and this again reaffirms a carceral uh, response to hate. Um, and I, I'll just remind folks that I'm coming from Minneapolis where um, a real movement, um, you know, certainly expanded from Black Lives Matter movements from around the country, but after the murder of George Floyd, um, I think has sparked a, a new iteration of that movement, which is, um, uh, one of abolition, not of not of reform. And so um, I look forward to talking more and hearing more about non-carceral responses to what's happening in our community. Yeah, and I'd just like to add um, a couple of uh, resources as well. Um, Erica emphasized, and it, it's so important to please um, report many of these hate incidents and crimes when they go unreported and we don't have that data, it is much more difficult for us to enact changes on the policy side. Um, second, some other uh, solutions that we look forward is increasing the inclusion of Asian Americans in all aspects of policymaking within the government. Um, that includes ensuring that there's cultural competency and that there's language access. Um, third, we want more engagement um, and investment within the Asian American community organizations that work on the ground with local communities. Um, Fourth, we, we wanna make sure people have the tools they need to respond to many of these hate incidents. Um, I included our Hollaback trainings that are now provided in multiple languages. Uh, we do find post-training evaluation that uh, many have been able to recognize and intervene when harassment has occurred. 75% uh, reported that intervening was a best practice in reducing trauma and de-escalation. And so we very much encourage you all, not just you, but many of your friends and colleagues um, to take some of these trainings to, to make sure that um, they can be an ally uh, for you. The burden is not just on those who are impacted, um, but we have many people in the community who also don't want this to be happening. Um, and lastly, of course, we want everyone to be very vigilant. We should call out public officials uh, who use xenophobic and racist rhetoric. We know that this has an impact that this incites hate and violence against our community. So whether it's from an elected official, the media, or even those around you, um, being able to call out, call it out so that people stop it is really integral. So you are all part of this um, movement and hope you can join some of our trainings. Great, thank you. Um, 
I'd also love to hear your thoughts, Ellen, um, if you want to add anything. Um, and I also want to um, add that there was an audience question that I think is really interesting and helpful here. Um, so do you guys have any thoughts on the impact of the Stop Asian Hate movement and this focused on individual hate rather than systematic violence? I'll open it up to anyone on the panel. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think I'm just going to use this to think out loud a little bit. One of the themes in the book that I'm writing now is the importance of um, data creation in the history of Asian Americans and the pursuit of racial justice. And I feel like the Stop Asian, Stop API Hate is a great example of, of, of uh, you know, an effort to do that. Um, and But I, I sort of have been thinking backwards really to, to like the 1940s and how for decades, Asian American advocates have tried to create a story about themselves, whether that's quantitative data or qualitative data, and present a portrait of their communities and the problems that their communities have faced. Uh, basically, I mean, essentially for like to the government, right? To um, and seeking um, seeking uh, support to solve those problems from the state, essentially, uh, and. I just want to throw out that I am, I think the questions that you're asking does um, invite us to think really hard about how some of that data might end up being uh, leading to unintended consequences. So I don't really have anything very specific here, except to say that I, I do think good information is absolutely critical. And yet, as we can see in this um, concern, I think a lot of people are sharing and one I share too, uh, about um, inadvertently perhaps um, uh, fueling the carceral stay. It's just a question I think we just need to keep thinking about where, where our data comes from and how, how it gets used. I would add that I think that, you know, one of the things that we need to also make sure of is that when crimes against the AAPI community are, are, um, are reported that we're not put in other category. You know, when I was looking for data for a grant that we were writing to find data on how many, you know, how many incidents of hate, they, hate there were against Asian Americans was almost non-existent. Because, you know, looking through it, it was, we were categor categorized as other. We were put together with other groups because they, they were saying that the number of incidents were so inconsequential. And I think that also goes back to the reporting that we've been talking about. Um, you know, I think that there are a number of us that probably have experienced anti-Asian hate, but how, much, how, how many of us have reported it? Because it's somebody saying something to us in passing. Or it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're on the bus and someone tells you to go back to where you came from. Or, you know, I had a intern that was at Union Station right after the pandemic started, who was, you know, who was yelled at. And so I said, you know, you need to report this. And her comment to me was, I don't want to report it. I don't want to make any, you know, I don't, I don't know who it was. I don't want to say anything. And when that happens, when our community, um, the larger, you know, and, and again, you know, there, Asia is a very large area and there are no, you know, so many different countries, but when we don't report it, then it comes, we, it looks as if the problem is not as significant as it actually is. Great, so we have another audience question. Um, so the question is, what are the panelists thoughts on political rhetoric, such as the threat from China? Um, what are your thoughts on media coverage of what happens in Asian countries, specifically Myanmar, Syria, and the legislation meant to address violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? Um, I know there are a few parts in the question, so if um, anyone has any thoughts on any of that, um, I'd love to, to hear them. I can uh, address the anti-China rhetoric. Um, Part of our work, we, you know, we caution um, against anti-China rhetoric. We have seen that historically Asian Americans and immigrants have essentially been treated and scapegoated as national security threats. And so when you see this type of rhetoric focused on, on one country, 
when we see the fact that our communities are often seen as monoliths, uh, it becomes almost this cyclical pattern. For example, right now, uh, we see that many Chinese researchers and scientists are being scapegoated um, as spies when we know that that is a, makes up a very small minority um, and that we should never be relying on ethnicity, but rather actual criminal activity. Uh, we often forget that Japanese incarceration was also rooted in this idea that all people of Japanese descent would commit acts of sabotage or commit acts of economic espionage. And certainly post 9-11, we saw that as well with Amemsa communities when it comes to um, charges of for terrorism. And so we have to be very mindful that whenever there are escalating tensions with the United States uh, and a foreign country, especially a foreign Asian country, um, that it often does lead to backlash uh, against our communities and public officials have to be very mindful. Language does matter and it does lead to violence, not only in the streets, but we see also uh, intimidation and profiling from our own government. Great. Um, thank you all. So I think we're gonna move on to um, our next topic, um, building solidarity. So as we discussed today, the AAPI terminology itself hides or conflates the disparities within the diaspora. And the model minority myth also sustains anti-Black racism. Particularly, there continues to be an erasure of Pacific Islander voices within the AAPI community. What does building solidarity for immigrant justice look like? both within the diaspora and with other racialized groups, what roles can lawyers play in building this solidarity? Um, can we go back to you, Gazella, and start with you? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Diana, and solidarity work is perhaps some of the toughest work, um, but we always need to start with our cornerstone. For us, even as we work to advance API issues, we always need to center that we're also building and promoting a fair and equitable society for everyone. So this means that we always need to address white supremacy and anti-Blackness, both externally in our community, but also internally. We see that it seeps into a lot of our work. Uh, for example, a, a very common issue in immigration advocacy is the invisibility of Black migrants and their issues not being at the forefront. So lifting up many of our colleagues in their work and many other communities allows us to have a much better advocacy for our own communities as well. Uh, it also means that we need to advocate and lift up for the most vulnerable within the API space. I remember one mentor of mine uh, once said, um, you know, the Hmong population is so small. For her to go at it alone, uh, it would be very difficult to achieve change. But within the larger API community, we can be a much more powerful movement and we can help and protect those who are the most vulnerable. And we also need to look at the fact that each one of our communities are going to have their own unique problems. And so if there's not that visibility, how can we help them? A good example is for um, many of the, the migrants under the Compact of uh, Free Association, COFA. So that includes citizens of the Federation of Macronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and, and the Republic of Palau. Uh, they can live and work in the US, but they don't, they're not eligible for many federal benefits, right? So if we're not aware of these unique needs, uh, we won't be able to help them. Additionally, it's, it's very important that we not only care about an issue area once it impacts us. So oftentimes in the work that I do for Chinese scientists and researchers, we address the question, well, profiling is now an issue that many new advocates are now entering because it's suddenly impacting their space. Are they going to be as encouraging of AMEMSA groups who have also been similarly profiled? Are they going to be as uh, supportive of uh, you know, the Black American and immigrant community who face profiling from law enforcement, right? So as we face the, these, you know, harms within our community, it's also looking externally and, and having that empathy. So solidarity work is a long road ahead. Uh, we need a lot more attorneys. Uh, we need a lot of more immigrant attorneys. Um, 
the amount of cultural competency that you can bring into it, the linguistic needs that you can bring into it, it's just so important, not just in direct client service, but how we shape our policy. Uh, a good example is, would we have had something like the China Initiative, or we would, would we have had things like the Muslim ban if more Asian American diversity, more Asian American voices uh, were included in the rooms? Certainly that alone is not enough, um, but it, it's, it's an important part of the, the broader movement. And I will share uh, one personal story. When I worked for a, a refugee and a asylum firm, uh, I received a lot of the clients uh, that my white, white male partner had, absolutely nice guy. Uh, but I, I started finding that every client of his that went to me uh, would suddenly have, um, be telling me that they had PTSD and start sharing a lot more about the mental traumas that they were facing. And they never once in, in the, the years they were talking with that white partner, they never once shared it with him. And so part of it is by your very existence, you do create a safe space for many vulnerable people. And so when you enter it, you do empower folks. And so I, I really hope many of you all uh, consider continuing down this path. Um, does any other panelists have any thoughts they would like to share on this question? I would just echo what Gazella said about, you know, um, for me, for direct services, I know that it has made a huge impact when I have a client who comes in and they see me as their attorney um, and not someone who is not Asian. Um, it makes a huge difference because for them, they open up a lot more and you know, even I'll, I'll tell them, like, I was born and raised here. I don't have the same, you know, I don't have the same um, background that you do, but I do understand the community. I do understand the pressures you are on, you know, especially with, with, if it's a domestic violence victim, to go back, to stay with your partner. Um, but you don't have to do that. And I think that that is something that sometimes is the first time they're hearing that, that there are other options. And that even though they may not choose that option, they do have it. Um, and it's not coming from someone who looks different from them. Great. Um, so we have an audience, audience question. Um, so the question is, how can we prevent additional data from becoming evidence in support of the carceral state? Could equitable and just policies move forward without relying on people to report their trauma and potentially support the carceral state in the process? I'll start just with a few brief thoughts because this is a real difficult, thorny question. It does seem that we are stuck in a system that um, rewards the counting of trauma, <laughs> the recounting of trauma, the upwards ticking of the numbers to make sure, to, to make us visible, <laughs> right? You know, and so one of the questions that I think many of us are asking is, do we have to, be attacked? Do some of us have to be um, murdered, you know, to, to, be, to be seen for the rest of the country to pay attention? Um, that's a really, you know, heart-wrenching question to ask. Um, so the data, and this is why I do appreciate the community-based organizations collecting the data rather than, say, um, reporting to to local police or the FBI. I, I defer to others to think about or to help instruct us on how that data then gets used and perhaps misused and like Ellen said, in unintentional ways. But the other thing, the other trends that I've seen um, during the pandemic are the community-based solutions, right? Um, 
local local youth organizing to um, you know and drawing on a history of of from the Black Panthers say in Oakland to escort their grandparents and other elderly residents to and from shopping, um, community watches, um, more, more systems of mutual aid um, rather, than, rather than relying on, on police and, and lawmakers. So I do wanna call attention to some of these trends that have, are already happening and folks who are already thinking about different ways of, um, of dealing with hate. It's a, it's a very terrific question. It's something we always have to grapple within the advocacy space, right? It's not just uh, the data, it's collecting impacted person stories. Um, what's so challenging, I mean, certainly what Erica mentioned, it's always best if the government will provide the data, if they disaggregate the data for us, show us how many um, people are, are, are in detention and, and to divide between um, you know, countries of origin so that we have a, we can conduct our own analysis. Um, but oftentimes, you know, when you submit for your request, when you are uh, trying to get information uh, about a specific case uh, or, or specific issue, it can be very hard um, to get that data. And then oftentimes we need to essentially find our own data um, and, and compile it ourselves, whether it's uh, getting surveys from the community at large, or if it is them sharing uh, their story. Um, it is always a struggle and it's always a balance. You know, when you have folks join you at meetings with Congress and they reshare their story, um, it, it is really traumatizing for them. And yet at the same time, it, it's also, um, one of the most effective ways in which uh, Congress, uh, you know, does make these shifts, does make these uh, movements, because it humanizes uh, the issue. Um, so it is always a struggle, and I think when when we try to grapple with a balance, we always want to make sure that if if we are um, going through that, if if we are having, um, you know, people experience it, um, having to reshare their story or have to, having to report these incidents that we, um, we use it in a way that will help the community, that we use it effectively, that we have them share their stories when, when we know that this is going to make an impact within that office and that particular office has um, a special power uh, within that, that space. Um, but it, 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 is, it, it is always going to be a struggle, I think. Great, thank you. Um, Ellen and Nazim, do you have anything that you wanna add or we can move on? You can move on. Okay. Um, let me see if there are any more audience questions. Still up. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so I don't see any more audience questions. So I just wanna um, ask if the, the panelists, anyone has any final thoughts or, you know, you know, comments that you had um, that you didn't get to say before for any of the questions. I know sometimes it takes a while to form a coherent answer to a question. Um, and I know we had a few audience questions that came up. Um, so if anyone has any final thoughts, um, I think this is the time for that. Yeah, I, I can start. I mean, there's a lot of work uh, within the advocacy space, within the civil rights uh, space. Uh, it, it, it is an area that, you know, just I very much encourage folks, whether it's through your clinic or some ways to um, have that experience, uh, see if it's the right path for you. But even if you don't enter into public interest law space, I've seen so many folks go into the private sector and enter in a different capacity, whether it's through pro bono work or through fundraising efforts as, as a board member, but there's always a way to be involved in, in the broader movement, regardless of, of what uh, specific uh, legal area you practice. So very much encourage you all to, to stay in touch and you know, stay involved. I, 
I think I'll just add something here, just a long kind of a little bit of an offshoot of Gisela's remarks. So I'm, you know, I'm in Indiana, and the thing is, I probably am dialing in from uh, the location that has maybe the least API um, people population, but actually there is a, a need in a lot of places around the country. Um, I, I think the popul our population is growing, but we just simply do not have much of a, um, a community infrastructure. Uh, I am uh, involved in um, I'm one of the, we, we recently founded a chapter of like uh, the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. And what we've realized is we're basically trying to build a lot of this intentional advocacy work um, from almost from scratch. I mean, there are um, immigration, um, organi pro-immigration organizations around and certainly immigration lawyers. Um, but for as far as AAPI specific groups, there, there isn't much going on. So I, if there's anybody out there, you know, who's willing to move to some of these places um, that are a little bit less um, served, I think I think there's a great need. Thank you for that. Yeah. I would just echo that. I mean, I think that there is a need for more um, AAPI attorneys, um, especially in the public sector. And I know that it's not for everybody, um, but it is, it makes a huge difference when someone comes in and they, you know, they look at you and they can identify with who you are um, and, 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 you, and you can identify with some of the things that who, of who they are. Um, and that doesn't always happen whether it's because of the language, because of the culture, um, it makes a huge impact on their case. And I also think that to dispel some of the model minority myth, we have to show that you know, our communities are out there and that they need these services. And it doesn't, you know, to, to recognize that the AAPI community is diverse, not just um, ethnically, but also um, economically, and um, you know, um, in so many different ways, but that doesn't happen unless we are able to help those people that are most in need. Great, um, Erica. Do you have anything you want to add? Or I just want to say thank you for. I'm, I've learned so much. My other dreamed career, if I wasn't going to be a historian, it was going to be an immigration lawyer and advocate. So <laughs> I love being in conversation with everybody and, and hope that the collective um, um, words of, of wisdom, if we've shared any, will help encourage many others to enter this field of direct work and advocacy. Um, and so I appreciate, I appreciate the program and have learned so much. Great. Um, well, thank you all for joining today, um, for having these conversations um, about pay amid a pandemic. Um, and I want to thank our co-sponsors and everyone for joining today. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that our next discussion on health justice is on March 21st. Um, Prashasi is also going to drop some resources, additional resources that we wanted to share. Um, and also we'll follow up with all of this information in an email. Great. Thank you all. Thank you.